everybody. Today's practice problem comes from Principles of Microeconomics, 6th edition by N. Gregory Mankiw. Today we are going to be doing chapter 5, problem number 3. This problem says, suppose the price elasticity of demand for heating oil is 0.2 in the short run and 0.7 in the long run. So I just started by writing that up here. And just as a reminder, price elasticity of demand is usually noted by little e or lowercase e with a d subscript here. So this is price elasticity of demand. So we have our information here. And then part A of the question asks, if the price of heating oil rises from $1.80 to two twenty dollars per gallon, what happens to the quantity of heating oil demanded in the short run and in the long run? And then it asks us to use the midpoint method in our calculations. So we want to start by thinking about, well, what is the formula for price elasticity of demand, and what is this midpoint method that we keep talking about? And so I actually left up the formula from yesterday's practice problem. And we can see that the price elasticity of demand is just the percent change in quantity demanded divided by the percent change in price. Some textbooks take the absolute value of this, so the elasticity is always represented by a magnitude or by a positive number. Some of them note that quantity demanded and price are generally going to be moving in opposite directions, and they just leave it as always negative. Either way is fine. Just be careful about what you're supposed to do. And the midpoint formula is this slight variation on this more basic percent change formula. And if you're not clear how the two relate to one another, please check out the practice problem from yesterday where we go over that in a pretty granular level of detail and do a lot of explaining. But here, suffice it to say that what we're doing when we're using the midpoint method is we're saying as a proxy for percent change in quantity demanded, we're taking the difference between the new quantity demanded and the old one and then dividing by the average of the new and old quantity. As a proxy for percent change in price, we're taking the difference between the new and the old price, and then dividing by the average of the new and old price. So you can see how we're sort of just slightly modifying the formulas for percent change when we use the midpoint method. Now I choose this problem because I found it interesting that the problem that we did yesterday had us use the elasticity formula forwards, that it gave us information on prices and quantity demanded and asked us to calculate the elasticity. That's fine. And now what we're being asked to do is we're being given the elasticity and given some information about one of the percent changes, and we're being asked essentially to solve for the other percent change. So we can think about how to plug in the information that we have and then do a little bit of algebra to solve for what we need. So we notice, let's start with the short run here. That we can say, in the short run, we know that our elasticity of demand, or to be more specific, our price elasticity of demand, is 0 0.2. So 0 0.2 has to equal this whole thing, right? So we can say 0 0.2 equals the absolute value of something. And then we can think about, well, what other information do we have? So our problem, if we go back and look at this, it says, if the price of heating oil rises from $1.80 to $2.20 per gallon. So we can put in that information. If we're having a rise from $1.80 to $2.20, then our new price is equal to $2.20. Our old price is equal to $1.80. And our average of our new and old price is, in fact, just $2. So what we don't know is what's happening to our quantity change. So we can look here and see, well, do we have any other information here? We're only given something in price, but the question is asking, what happens to the quantity of heating oil demanded in the short run and in the long run? So we can at least figure out, well, 
what should this number be in general? And then use that, again, in reverse as a proxy for percent change, because that's really the best that we can do, right? So if we were to just call this x, what we would really want to be doing is solving for x. And we could see here, we could substitute, we could simplify this a little bit. And we would see that we would get 0 0.2 is equal to the absolute value of x divided by well, 220 minus 180 is 0.4 divided by 2. So this is just going to be 0 0.2 is equal to the absolute value of x divided by, well, 0.4 divided by 2 is just 0.2. And in fact, x divided by 0.2 is just x times the reciprocal of 0.2, which is 5. So this is actually just saying 0 0.2 is equal to the absolute value of 5 times x. Now, we know that x is actually going to be a negative number because we were told that price and quantity move in opposite directions. So if we had a positive change in price, if we had an increase in price, we must have a decrease in quantity demanded. So if we were to look at this, we would say actually that x was equal to negative 0 0.2 over 5. And we could see from here, we can calculate what this is. I might say, for example, that this is equal to negative 0 0.4 over 10, which is just negative 0 0.4. 0, 4. So to an approximation, because again, this thing here isn't exactly equal to percent change, but to the degree that we can actually conclude something based on the information that we are given, I would say that this number suggests that in reaction to this price increase from $1.80 to 220, we're going to see a negative 0 0.04 times 100% or a 4% decrease in quantity demanded. And that's probably the most specific we can be with the information that we were given. Now again, I just organized a little bit and said, in the short run, in response to the price change that we've been talking about, we're going to see that there's a 4% decline in the quantity demanded of heating oil. And now we want to go back and we want to repeat this exercise for what's going to happen to the quantity demanded of heating oil in the long run. And we said in the long run that we're facing an elasticity of demand of 0 0.7. So we can go through the same exercise and do the same algebra. And that's, it's actually good practice to make sure we know what we're doing, right? So here, I can, again, just plug in what I know into the formula and then go from there. So here I could say that 0 0.7 has to equal the absolute value of, well, again, this is what I'm trying to find, and I'm given neither the old nor the new quantity. If I was given one of those, I could be a little bit more precise, but we're working with what we're given. But what I do know is information about prices. And I said here that the new price was $2.20 and the old price was $1.80. So we just take that difference and then we divide by the average of the old and new prices, which is just $2. And again, this is the thing that we don't know. So this is the thing that we're trying to solve for. And you'll notice that this looks very, very similar to what we did last time. Actually, the only thing that's changing is this number here. And we'll come back and think about how the fact that this is the only thing that's changing would allow us to figure out what we should be getting here without doing all the math over. But we can certainly do this. We can say 0 0.7 is equal to the absolute value of x divided by, again, 0.4 divided by 2. So we could say that 0 0.7 is equal to the absolute value of x divided by 0.2. And we said that that, as before, notice that this is all the same, 
But this is the same as saying 0 0.7 is equal to the absolute value of 5 times x. This time, let's think about this a little bit differently to make sure we have a handle on our arithmetic. I could divide both sides by 5 here because what I know is that I can pull a 5 out of here. I'm ultimately going to be looking for a negative number for x because I know that when I have a positive price change, I'm looking for a decrease in quantity demanded or a negative change in quantity demanded. But nonetheless, I can say here, for example, that the absolute value of x must equal 0 0.7 divided by 5. And notice that if we were to multiply the top and the bottom both by 2, we could see that this is just 0. Point, sorry about that, that this is just 1.4, obviously 0.7 times 2 is 1.4. And 5 times 2 is 10. So we would see that the absolute value of x is equal to 0 0.14. And because we know that x has to be negative, we could then conclude that x is equal to negative 0.14. And this x, or this percent change, or proxy for percent change, being negative 0.14, what that really means is that our quantity demanded has decreased by 0.14 times 100%, or 14%. So we could look at what's going on here, and we could notice that really all that's changed is what we had on this side. But the fact that we had a larger elasticity number carried through and gave us a proportionally larger change in quantity demanded than we had over here. So again, to summarize, we said that in response to this price change from $1.80 to 220 in the price of heating oil, in the short run, we were only going to see a 4% decline in the quantity demanded of heating oil. But in the long run, we were going to see a 14% decline in the quantity demanded of heating oil. Now, the next part of the question, the part B of the question, says why might this elasticity depend on the time horizon? Now, we can think about that directly. And we said that, well, we tend to see higher elasticities, or we tend to see more price sensitivity in the long run than in the short run, because people have more of an opportunity to change their behaviors. So for example, if heating oil got much more expensive, over the long run, I could take a number of measures to sort of mitigate that, right? To avoid just keep buying the same amount of heating oil, I could move to a smaller house. I could buy more sweaters. I could put the saran wrap stuff in the windows. There's a lot of stuff I could do if I had the time and I could actually get around to doing it. Whereas in the short run, I have a lot less flexibility. So in the short run, I just kind of have to eat the price increase because I don't have as much opportunity to change my behavior. What that translates to is less elastic behavior because in the short run, I'm less able to run away from that cost because I'm sort of committed in the short run to doing things a certain way. So we could say that this is completely consistent with the idea that we tend to see higher elasticity over longer time horizons than over shorter time horizons. We could also think about the logic of this by thinking about the percent changes in quantity demanded. Then in the short one, we're kind of stuck. We can only make our quantity demand to go down by a little bit. But in the long run, in response to that same price change, we were able to make our quantity demanded go down by more because we could figure out new ways to switch away from the heating oil that increased in price.